So good morning also from my side and welcome to the fourth panel of this conference, which will look at CBDC and uh, money mar uh, monetary policy impl uh, implementation. And I'm happy to chair a panel that reverses the usual gender balance uh, in this topic. So um, the first presenter will be Nora Lamasdorf. Please, Nora, there is you. Okay, that looks good. Perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, hi everyone. First of all, thanks a lot to the organizers for including our paper to this really great conference. Um, this is joint work with Tobias Linsert and Cyril Monet. And since Tobias is working at the ECB, the usual uh, disclaimer applies. So this paper is about CBDC, monetary policy implementation in the interbank market. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to motivate a lot why CBDC is interesting. Um, it's definitely high on the agenda of I would say many academics and basically all central banks worldwide. Um, so far, most of the papers or many papers are focusing on the macro implications of CBDC. So, for example, the paper by Williamson, Christian Sanchez or Stuart Al. Um, however, there are fewer papers on the micro impl impl uh, implications and notably on the money markets. Although this conference greatly shows that also this front is um, developing quite a lot. So what we do in our paper is we study the effects of CBDC on the interbank market for reserves. So we take the general equilibrium model of banking and payments, including CBDC, and here we are um, using the Chiu et al. recent JBE paper to do that. And we add to that model end of the day refinancing shocks in the spirit of pool. And we do that to analyze the effects of CBDC demand and different design features. We assume that CBDC is a liability to the central bank, and it's channeled via banks. So to make it available to their clients, banks basically need the cash to acquire it. So this is basically equivalent to a 100% reserve requirement. So we do not really take a stance on how the market share of CBDC is formed. So we take that as exogenously giving, but we study what happens when this market share of CBDC is increased. And we find that if this market share is increased, this will drain reserves, and when reserves in the system are scarce, it will increase the interbank rate. However, the effect of CBDC remuneration on the demand for reserves and the interbank rate is somehow ambiguous. And as you will see in a minute, it, will, uh, it depends on banks' lending costs, so how costly it is for banks to find profitable investment projects. And then we also study two important topics that are yeah, pretty prominent in these days' policy discussions which are caps and also tiered remuneration. And we find that both tend to decrease the uh, demand for reserves and the interbank rate. And they actually have similar effects as lowering the remuneration rate, which is, is makes CBDC less attractive. Okay, so I already mentioned the model is based on the recent Chu et al paper, um, but we simplify this paper a little bit in the sense that we have perfect competition in the deficit market and we have sellers accepting only two means of payment. So this is deposits and CBDC. But then we add to that model an interbank market, and also the banks in this model are facing end-of-the-day liquidity shocks in the spirit of pool. And these shocks take place once the interbank market is closed. So then the banks have still the opportunity to turn to the central bank's uh, lending facility in case they need more reserves. Okay, so very important in our model are entrepreneurs or the relationship between entrepreneurs and banks. Entrepreneurs need to borrow bank, uh, bank deposits from the banks in order to buy investment products to produce something. So one bank leads to N entrepreneurs, and to do so it incurs some cost, C of N, because it has to find these entrepreneurs, it has to negotiate maybe. Um, okay, and then the entrepreneur uses these bank deposits to buy investment products and to produce something. However, a fraction of gamma of these entrepreneurs will be hit by a reinvestment shock. So in order to keep producing, they will need to buy additional reinvestment goods. So this is the red Y here. And if they don't do that, they will end up producing nothing. And this gamma, so this fraction of entrepreneurs that got deposits from the, from the uh, that got loans from the bank, is bank specific and distributed according to some distribution function. <clears throat> And once these entrepreneurs are hit by the reinvestment shock, they will have the opportunity in market one, so this is a decentralized market, 
to go to sellers to buy the um, additional needed reinvestment good. And there are two types of sellers in our economy. So fraction omega one of these sellers only accept bank deposits and a fraction omega two only accept CBDC. And since these entrepreneurs are funded by the bank, it will need additional funding to buy these additional needed reinvestment goods. This reinvestment shock for the entrepreneur is basically a refinancing shock for the bank. So out of these N entrepreneurs a bank has funded, a fraction gamma will be hit by this refinancing shock and a fraction omega one will need deposits to buy this additional needed um, reinvestment good. And for those gamma N omega one entrepreneurs, the bank can just issue new deposits. And for the other entrepreneurs who need CBDC, so this will be gamma N times omega two, um, the bank will turn to the central bank to acquire more CBDC and give it to the entrepreneurs. And while doing that, the bank is facing new reserve requirements. And in order to fulfill these, the bank can either use excess reserve that it still has, or it can turn to the central bank, um, to the central bank's lending facility. And importantly, this refinancing shock um, takes place after the interbank market closes. So if the bank then realizes that it has, um, that it needs more reserve, it can turn to the central bank who offers the lending facility at the lending facility rate. And in case the bank still has access to um, reserves, it can deposit them at the deposit facility, earning the deposit facility rate. And these two um, rates set by the central bank will determine the interbank market rate. Um, Okay, so this timeline gives you an overview of the model. So each period is split into two periods, where uh, two markets, and the market one is this decentralized market, and market two is the centralized market um, in the tradition of Lagos and Wright. And in the market two of the last period, banks give loans to entrepreneurs, occurring that cost C of N. And then in the beginning of the next period, there's an interbank market open where banks can trade reserves among each other. And after this, that interbank market has closed, a fraction gamma of the entrepreneurs will be hit by this reinvestment shock. So we'll need additional reserves because, I don't know, machine broke down on the weekend or something like that. And these entrepreneurs can, will meet sellers who sell this uh, reinvestment good. And a fraction omega one will only accept deposit, deposits. And a fraction omega two will only accept CBDC. And the bank will give these additionally needed funds to the entrepreneurs and then faces new reserve requirements. And in order to fulfill those, since the interbank market is already closed, it can turn to the central bank and either lend from the, or borrow from the central uh, lending facility or deposit at the deposit facility. Okay, and in addition to banks, entrepreneurs and sellers, we of course also have buyers in our model. And these buyers buy in the market one, so the central, uh, decentralized markets where they also meet either deposit or um, CBDC sellers. And these um, first order conditions will determine the demand of buyers for CBDC or deposits. So and the demand for deposits and CBDC will depend on the interest rate, of course. Because if so one unit, um, or X units of an asset A can buy X times the interest rate. So the interest rate on deposits or CBDC will determine the purchasing power of deposit and CBDC. And then if the interest rate is higher, the uh, purchasing power will be higher. And here the deposit rate is an equilibrium outcome. So this, uh, the commercial banks will set the deposit rate in order to, to steer the amount of deposits that um, buyers want to hold, and the interest rate on central bank will be set by the central bank. And the interest rate on CBDC, sorry, so RE will be set by the central bank. And we assume that if either the interest rate on CBDC or deposit is increasing, or if the market share of sellers accepting either CBDC or deposit is increasing, then this will uh, increase the demand for either deposits or CBDC. Okay, but at the heart of our um, paper, of our model, is the bank's problem. So suppose the bank finances N entrepreneurs and draws through this refinancing shock gamma. And we assume, and in the paper we show this a little bit more formal, that the productivity of these entrepreneurs is always large enough 
such that the bank finds it profitable to refinance these entrepreneurs. <clears throat> okay, and out of the N entrepreneurs the bank has financed, gamma, uh, gamma times omega one will need deposits to buy, and each entrepreneur will need one of RD deposits in order to buy one unit of the investment good. And for them, the bank needs additional reserves in the amount of chi times that amount. So chi is the reserve requirement on deposits. And for the omega-2 gamma N entrepreneurs who need CBDC to buy the reinvestment good, so they each need one over RE CBDC to buy one unit of the investment good. And for them, the bank needs the exact same amount in reserves. And the sum of these two will determine the overall amount a bank will need. And this is basically the pool shock in our model. So this is the additionally needed um, amount of reserves a bank will need after this refinancing shock has taken place. However, before the shock takes place, the interbank market opens. And here the bank chooses the amount of reserves it wants to trade. So this is YJ. Um, not knowing whether it will be long or short in reserves after this refinancing shock. And if it's long in reserves, it can deposit the uh, excess reserve that's a deposit facility, earning that deposit facility rate. And if it's short in reserve, it will need to borrow additional amount of the reserve, paying the lending facility rate. And whether a bank will be short or long in reserves will depend, of course, on the size of this reinvestment shock, so this gamma. And if gamma is relatively small, um, specifically lower than gamma bar, then a bank will still be long in reserves. And if it's higher than gamma bar, a bank will be short in reserves. So you see, we'll see in the simulation that this gamma bar is really important. So, to, so this is the threshold above which a bank will be short in reserves, and below it will still be long in reserves. And the first order condition to that gives us the money market rate, which is basically a weighted average of the deposit and lending facility rate of the central bank, where the weights are basically the probabilities, how likely it is to access one of the two facilities. And as it's also, also quite typical in these models, um, since all the banks are the same, the interbank market clearing condition applies, then in the end, no trade will be happening on the interbank market. However, still a money market rate will be determined by the central bank's facility rate. Okay, in addition to that problem on the interbank market, a bank also chooses the amount of investments, so the amount of entrepreneurs it wants to fund, and the amount of reserves and deposits. And it does so in order to maximize this object, where the first um, term here is what the bank gains after production takes place. And the second term is what the bank occurs. So this is the cost to find new entrepreneurs. And then it has to pay um, for deposits um, and also for these newly um, needed deposits after the, inter, uh, after the refinancing shock has taken place. And this is subject to two constraints, where the first is just the balance sheet identity. So in, um, loans to entrepreneurs and reserves need to be equal to deposits. And the second is the um, reserve requirement. So excess reserves need to be larger or equal to zero. Okay, and whether these excess reserves are larger or equal to zero, that will determine two different equilibria. So one equilibrium regime is the one where the reserve constraint is binding, so there are no excess reserves. And the other one is one with abundant reserves, so where excess reserves are larger than zero. So let me now turn to the simulations. And first, we will look at what happens when the CBDC market share increases. And remember, so the CBDC market share omega-2 is exogenous in our model. So we just look what happens when this market share is going to be increased. And in this graph, we can differentiate three different zones. The first zone is at the very beginning, when omega-2 uh, is very low. And you see in the graph in the uh, bottom left that I'm a, um, gamma bar is equal to one. So that means there's no refinancing shock that is larger than omega one that brings a bank to being short in reserves. So there are so many excess reserves in the economy that a bank will never be short in reserves. And you see here that the land, amount in the lending facility here, this orange line, will be equal to zero. And the amount in the deposit facility will be relatively high. 
Also, you see that the money market rate and the deposit rate are constant and they're equal to the deposit facility rate. So this is basically a flawed regime. However, as omega-2 increases, more CBDC is used and more reserves will be needed. So the demand for reserves increases and at some point this threshold gamma bar will be lower than one. So now there are some refinancing shocks that are so large that a bank will be short on reserves. And you see also that now the amount of the lending facility we will, will be larger than zero and the amount in the deposit facility is decreasing. And since the demand for reserves is now increasing, also the money market rate will increase, but also the deposit rate will increase because banks want to attract more demand for deposits. And there, for the demand for deposits, there are actually two effects. So first, there's this very direct effect. As the share of CBC meetings increases, the share of deposit meetings decreases, so less deposits are needed. <clears throat> However, in order to increase the demand for deposits, banks will increase the deposit rate, and that will actually increase the demand for deposits. And you see there's a small region here where actually this latter effect dominates, so where demand for deposits is slightly increasing in the share of omega-2. However, at some point, the first effect will, so this direct effect will dominate and the demand will decrease again. And as the share of CBDC meetings becomes higher and higher, more reserves are needed, and this gamma um, bar will be decreasing until it reaches zero, which means that even the tiniest refinancing shock will make a bank become short in reserves. And at that point, you see here that the amount in the deposit facility will be equal to zero, and the amount in the lending facility will be relatively high. And also the money market rate will be quite high, and it will, I hope you can, I don't know if you can see that, it, at some point it will be constant again and will be equal to the uh, central bank's lending facility rate. So now I haven't mentioned loans yet. So you see that the loans, so this is the blue line here, will decrease in the share of CBDC meetings. And that is because now um, funding entrepreneurs will become more costly for banks because they will need more reserves. Um, and that's why banks will decide to give fewer loans out to entrepreneurs. So to summarize the effects here, we can, we can say that the increasing the share of CBDC meetings will drain reserves in the economy and will therefore increase the money market rate and also the deposit rate. So I think this is rather intuitive. Um, however, when we look at the effect of the CBDC remuneration rate, this is a little bit less intuitive because as the CBDC rate increases, CBDC has a higher purchasing power, which leads actually to two different effects. So the first effect is a funding effect, which um, says that to fund the same amount of entrepreneurs, now banks will need less funding, because if in the case that uh, entrepreneurs need CBDC to buy more investment goods, CBDC has now a higher purchasing power, and therefore they will need less CBDC. And that will decrease the demand for reserves, and it will also decrease the interbank rate. However, there's a second effect, which we call the lending effect, which means that since now it's cheaper to fund entrepreneurs, banks will fund more entrepreneurs. And that will again now push us to, uh, the demand for reserves up, and therefore also the money market rate. And which of these two effects will dominate will, in the end, depend on the lending cost. So how costly is it for a bank to find new investment projects, to find new uh, entrepreneurs? So when we simulate that, you see on the left-hand side the effects for low lending costs and the right-hand side for high lending costs. And in the case of low lending costs, where this lending effect dominates, you see that loans are actually increasing quite a lot when we increase the CBDC rate. And that will mean that um, banks will need more reserves to buy these additional needed, um, yeah, to buy more CBDC in case of refinancing shock. And since the demand for reserves is increasing, also the money market rate is increasing and also the deposit rate is increasing because banks want to attract more deposits. If this funding effect is dominating, however, you see that loans are still increasing a little bit because it's still cheaper to fund entrepreneurs. However, since this funding effect is dominating, um, overall, the demand for reserves from banks will um, decrease, which will also decrease the money market rate and the deposit rate. 
However, the amount of excess reserves, so this is um, the deposits minus the loans um, on the bank's balance sheet, which banks held ahead of this refinancing shock, they will decrease because loans are in both cases increasing, deposits are relatively constant and here a little bit decreasing. Yeah. Um, so we can say that a higher CBDC rate will tend to drain reserves, but the effect on the money market rate is ambiguous. And specifically, it depends on the bank's lending cost. Okay, so now let me come to one, um, yeah, maybe like policy exercise. So in the paper, we study both the caps on CBDC and also tiered remuneration. Here, we'll only focus on the caps. So on the simulation, you will see next, we have two different caps, a low and a high one. And we assume that each entrepreneur can only buy from one seller, because otherwise it could just go to a lot of sellers, never hitting this cap. Um, <clears throat> okay, and if the purchasing power of that cap, so if the cap times its interest rate is smaller than one, and one is what the entrepreneur would need to buy an additional investment good, it has to liquidate some of its initial investment. An aggregate liquidation in the economy is what a single entrepreneur needs to liquidate times this refinancing shock times all the entrepreneurs who will need CBDC to buy additional reinvestment goods. And here you see that the effects of increasing omega-2 and the CBDC rate in general are the same. But now when we compare a relatively high cap, which is the solid line in this graph, and the relatively low cap, which is the dashed line, you see that in both cases, investment, so the dotted line here and there, will be lower when the cap is relatively low. Um, so we can say that a tighter, crab, tab, tighter cap will decrease investment. And that is because entrepreneurs will have to liquidate some amount of the initial investment, and therefore the effective productivity of entrepreneurs will be lower. And banks taking this into account will give loans to fewer entrepreneurs because of that. And you also see that the dashed line for uh, the money market rate here is also lower. And this is the case since now banks give out fewer loans, fewer reserves will be needed, and that pushes down the interbank rate. And you see that the effect is especially large when the CBDC rate is relatively low. Okay, and the amount of liquidity uh, or liquidation can be interpreted as a measure of inefficiency in our model. And to see how that aggregate measure of inefficiency evolves, um, we can see that once the market share of CBDC is relatively high, a low cap will um, increase the amount of inefficiency. So we'll increase the amount of liquidation. And here, what is more interesting maybe is that the amount of liquidation is decreasing in the CBDC rate. I mean, it's higher for in the case of a low cap than in the case for a high cap, but it's in decreasing in the CBDC rate. So in principle, the central bank could choose a higher CBDC rate to undo the detrimental effect of its cap, if it wants to do so. Um, okay, so now let me conclude. So what we do in our paper is we build a model adding end of the day refinancing shocks to a general equilibrium model of banking and payments, which includes CBDC. And we find that when we increase the CBDC market share, this will drain reserves and when reserves are scarce, this will increase the interbank rate. However, the effect of CBDC remuneration on the interbank market is ambiguous. And as you saw, it depends on the bank's lending cost. And then in the paper, we study both the effects of caps and also tiered remuneration. And we find that cap, a cap on CBDC will lower the loans and increases the inefficient liquidation in the economy. And in the paper, we show that the two tiered remuneration system is basically equivalent to a reduction in a CBDC single rate. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Nora. And the discussion will be done by Anna Kekosse from the Bank for International Settlements. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as the slides are loading, uh, let me start with uh, thanking the organizers for putting together this, I think, very relevant conference. Um, 
and I, th I really like the idea of bringing together like the the, uh, the researchers and the policy makers. Um, so I think this is a really a great event. Um, I also would like to I saw, sort of thank the authors, but also the organizers again to giving me the opportunity to read this paper. Um, because I must say I learned a lot. I am not a person with a background in monetary policy, interbank market. I'm also not a theoretical modeling person. I'm more empirics. Uh, I have a background in uh, understanding payment habits. Um, so I, I learned a lot. And I think that's also to say that um, please do not expect very in-depth comments from me about the model. Um, but I would, what I would like to do today is really to um, maybe uh, come up with some suggestions on, on um, how to maybe enrich the model, if possible, um, with some um, assumptions or ideas really reflecting uh, what the current status is of central banks in their thinking about the motivations of issuing a CBDC um, and the design choices. So it's really more about uh, yeah, suggestions to, to align it with, uh, with the policy discussions that we see at central banks today. So, I'll start with a short summary. Um, so, but the, the key question of the paper is really what is the impact of a CBDC uptake um, on interbank market rates? And then they do some scenario analysis or some, some further assessments of different remuneration um, policies and, and holding limits. In terms of modeling, um, what it's basically doing, it's combining elements of uh, the money market model of Berenson and Monet from 2005 and the CBDC model of Chu et al. from 2023. I just saw in, in the slides, but I, I, in the paper I, I saw 22. But anyway, it's combining elements of these two, these two models. Um, and what I think is key, what are the key assumptions to this paper? Um, it's really like the behavior of the banks. Um, and the assumptions are that banks have no market power when issuing deposits. Um, and then in the first investment round that they face, uh, they, they will finance some entrepreneurs with deposits. Um, and then banks are assumed to be subject to a reserve requirement really as a fraction of the deposit issued. Um, and then banks acquire these, uh, the, these reserves by either issuing deposits or borrowing reserves on the interbank market. Then at the end of the day, uh, when the interbank market closes, um, they are faced with a refinancing shock where some of these entrepreneurs need more money, either in the form of deposits or in the form of CBDC, depending on the demand from the market and the end users. If this demand is uh, in the form of CBDC, uh, then banks uh, are assumed to buy these CBDCs with reserves. And these reserves would then be subject to a 100% reserve requirement. So not fractional reserve uh, requirement, but really 100%. That's, I think, the key difference with deposits. Um, and, um, and then it's also assumed that banks only have access to central bank deposit and lending facilities and may actually borrow these reserves. So the findings, um, I think what they really show is that an increasing CBDC usage uh, drains reserves and may increase the interbank uh, rate. Banks might also increase deposit rates to increase deposits. Um, and then they also acknowledge that central banks can undo the effect by supplying more reserves. Then when looking at the effect of remuneration, uh, the conclusion is, well, it, it depends. Uh, because there's two different uh, opposing effects. There's a funding effect and an investment effect. So the funding effect uh, is basically that because of this uh, interest remuner remuneration in CBDC, um, in the end, less CBDC would be needed for the same outputs, so less reserves would be needed. At the same time, because this funding becomes sort of cheaper for banks, banks can fund more firms, which would then mean more reserves are needed. And that's the investment effect. So it's really about the, the final effect really depends on the size of each of these two different, uh, different effects. And then they look at the holding limits uh, and they find that holding limits reduce the interbank and the commercial deposit rates. Uh, because banks, they require fewer deposits um, to buy reserves. Um, and, but again, there they say central banks can reverse the degrees uh, in investment by higher CBDC rate. Finally, I also looked at, they look at uh, tiered remuneration um, and what they find is really that this generates a similar effect as just one single, single rate, which is then, uh, would then be a little bit lower. 
So my comments, I think I think I have three three comments. Um, and like I said in the beginning, these comments are not really about the model itself or the details of the model, but more about um, yeah how these some of the key assumptions fit within the current discussions, the current policy discuss discussions among banks or within banks. So one of the first um, assumptions that I, uh, if I under interpret it right, uh, the, the paper is saying in our model, one can interpret the CBDC as a type of commercial bank deposit carrying a 100% reserve requirement. Being earmarked for CBDC, these reserves are remunerated at the rate I. So I tried to visualize that assumption um, based on uh, an earlier paper uh, produced by uh, Rafael Auer and, 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 and Burma, 2021. Um, and if I understand it correctly, this assumption is basically saying that end users, uh, they can hold retail CBDC and, and bank deposits, and both would then be a direct claim on the commercial bank, with then the only difference being that the commercial bank, the CBDC deposits would be 100% backed by reserves, and the traditional deposits would be fractionally be backed with, well, only a portion of reserves. And then they would hold these reserves at the central bank. So I'm... Um, so, so, and I, th I think this construction is also known as like being um, uh, a synthetic CBDC or um, uh, a rigid stable coin. So I'm not really sure if I if if this is the the right way to go, or maybe I misinterpret the model. Could well be because I think a CBDC is in fact a direct claim on the central bank. Um, so it would actually not show up on the balance sheet of of the commercial bank. So it would actually not be. Uh, affected by any bankruptcy of, of the commercial bank. It would not rely on, on the soundness of the commercial bank at all. Um, so that's, that's a key difference, I think. Um, so so that, then here my question comes in, would this model and the findings differ when really thinking about the CBDC as being a direct claim on the central bank and not being show, not showing up on the, on the bank the balance sheets of the commercial bank? And of course, I mean, there are all kinds of differences in these two different type of constructs. I mean, there are regulatory, supervisory, legal, uh, insurance uh, related differences, but also, are there also monetary policy related issues? I'm not sure, I'm not the expert here, uh, but maybe there are in terms of crisis, uh, because again, um, these, these, uh, if it's their direct claim on a central bank, uh, it would not be subject to any uh, claims in terms of uh, bankruptcy. My second uh, point of question is about uh, the stickiness uh, in deposits, uh, because there's a trade-off between remuneration and riskiness of the banks. Um, so, because concerns about this outflow of deposits, uh, it not only depends on the features of the CBDC, but also on the riskiness of these deposits uh, and the remuneration of these. And so there might be differences across banks. Um, and how does the model allow for that? Um, and there might even be differences between uninsured deposits and insured deposits. So again, also there, if, could the model allow for that? Um, and would the results be different in that case? And now finally, uh, another assumption of the paper is that no sellers ever accept cash in the economy. And to me, I think that's a very strong assumption. Um, and I was really wondering how would the results change when allowing for a competition between CBDC and cash? And to me, that's important because when, when what we learn from central banks is that CBDC uh, is seen as a way also to enhance financial inclusion, especially in developing economies, but also in, in advanced economies, it's also seen as a way to enhance digital inclusion. So, and to digitalize P2P payments, which are currently paid for by in, in cash. So how, how would the results differ when, when accounting for that and including cash in the model? I mean, I can assume that might limit the decline in the demand for deposits or maybe increase the demand for deposits if it really draws more people into the official financial system. So um, actually to further um, sort of, um, yeah, show that I think it, a CBDC will have, a, of cash will have, a, of CBDC will also have an impact on CBDC. I took this graph from results of uh, the annual CBDC survey carried out by the BIS. And if you look at the third uh, driver, so this is showing the key drivers of CBDC work by banks. And financial inclusion is actually among the key drivers of the CBDC work, especially in, in emerging markets and developing economies. But also in advanced economy, it's an increasing motivation. So I think that makes it pretty likely that CBDC will not only impact the demand for deposits, but also the demand for cash. 
And then this this final graph, I think, also is to 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 substantiate that uh, that that claim is that it's actually a study um, done by a couple of ECB uh, colleagues. They looked at substitution of banknotes and overnight deposits in three hypothetical scenarios. Um, and then on the left, you see uh, three scenarios in yeah three scenarios um, and and then the digital take up by sector. Uh, scenario one, the one on the left, is a scenario where the uptake of CBDC is really limited. CBDC is only used for retail payments, but to a, to a limited extent. Level B, the middle scenario, is really a lot, is assuming very high uptake of CBDC, where CBDC is used for retail payments, but also for a store of value. No caps, no remuneration. And the, scenario three is, um, is uh, sort of a capped scenario where the uptake is assumed to be like where every household is assumed to have like this maximum within this cap of 3000 3000 cbd euro of digital euro um and then that visitors uh, can also use the cbdc only for retail and you can see that in in every scenario um the cbdc is really found also to substitute cash so yeah my question here is really um how would the model change or the results change when when accounting for this um let me stop here. I think again, it's it's a great paper. I learned a lot, and I, I look forward to to hear yeah others' views on these three uh, three points. Many thanks. Thank you very much. So I would open the floor for for questions. One is there. One is there. You got money. Should should I start? Okay. So my question concerns um, the issue that the central bank might just treat this demand for reserves from CBDC as an autonomous factor in liquidity management, so try to fully accommodate this. And if I remember correctly, the size or the share of the firm suffering your refinancing shock is uh, fixed, so it's not, not stochastic. So um, is there any aggregate uncertainty about the reserve demand emanating from this, from this uh, reinvestment shock? And if there is none, why wouldn't the central bank just try to preemptively accommodate this additional um, reserve demand? Thank you. Um, so uh, two quick questions. Uh, so um, going back to the discussant's point about cash and you don't have cash in the model, uh, my understanding of the model is if you had cash, it would have similar impact on reserve requirements as CBDC. So uh, one way to kind of get around that would be maybe think about cash and CBDC uh, as a composite. And the second is uh, for Omega 2, that drives the, um, the market share of CBDC, uh, but it's independent of the cap when you look at the CBDC cap analysis, right? So uh, it would be nice if you could get to a model where if Omega 2 was, uh, sorry, if the cap was zero so that you couldn't hold CBDC at all, you kind of get to the case we're in now, right, where you don't have CBDC. Sorry, I didn't understand something of the model, so I explained a lot about the refinancing shock. But how about the, the I mean, the goods market? I don't know where these entrepreneurs spend this money. Uh, I mean, part of this is coming back to the banking system, I guess. I didn't understand this part, how much of these um, reserves that are drained come back, actually, after uh, the refinancing payments. Sorry, the reinvestment payments. Um, yes. Um, one uh, uh, question on uh, uh, there was lots of emphasis on the substitu uh, substitutability between the various uh, forms of uh, uh, deposit uh, cash. CBDCs, and this refers, if you want, to the broader concept that the BIS is working on, on the singleness of money. And uh, uh, we we were discussing with uh, Anika yesterday about exactly this point, and I want to hear the panel opinion on, on this issue. I mean, we all assume that there's one-to-one -one exchange rate between all this form of uh, money. But in reality, this is uh, not by construction, or but because we want this to be, uh, or there are market forces that makes uh, this to be the case. But in a world in which uh, the new form of cash, the digital cash, will have potentially 
lots of other features, such as programmability? How can we ensure that these implicit exchange rates remain one-to-one -one and don't deviate from that? Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks for the very clear presentation. I just had uh, one question about the interbank market. Uh, just clarifying question. So I understood that uh, uh, some banks will uh, need more reserves, and other banks have a surplus. So I thought there was. I thought I was like that seems nice because we know that some banks have more reserves uh, than other banks now. But then you said that there's no actual trading on the interbank market. So I just didn't. I don't know if I understood that correctly, but I, I just wonder why then in the end, uh, is, there actually, is there no transactions, but is there a price pinned down and how does that work? Yeah, just a short technical question that also Anneke uh, took up in her discussion, namely, does it show up in the balance sheet of a bank or not? Uh, since the digital euro is a claim on the central bank, it does not. Actually, I agree, but yesterday we learned that the digital euro amounts are counted as part of the reserve requirements. So in somehow, banks must take this into account. So then they have reserve requirements and the deposits with the central bank are of course a, a claim in the balance sheet of the, the commercial banks, but at the same time, these wallet balances um, some, somehow take into account. So I would like to hear from both of you uh, how you think that works and whether that affects the findings. More questions? So if not, then you have time to answer this pretty broad range of questions. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so first of all, Annika, thanks a lot for this great discussion. This is super helpful. And also thanks to everyone for, for all these questions and comments. Um, so maybe, so let's start on the, the bank the balance sheet question. Um, so, so we don't assume that, that CBDC will show up in banks' balance sheet, but CBDC will be channeled through banks, and banks will need reserves, so that, but they bring the reserves to the central bank, take this CBDC from the central bank and give it basically directly to their clients, so it won't stay on the bank's balance sheet. Um, so to the question on the, the interbank market, so why there's no trading, um, that some banks are short and some banks are long in reserves, this will be the case after this refinancing shock takes place, and then the interbank market is closed. So then the banks can only turn to the central bank's facility. Um, that's why there's no... Because ex ante, the banks don't know which how large this refinancing shock will be. So that's why there are, there's no trading on the interbank market. Um, and there was a question on the substitutability of deposits, CBDC, and possibly cash. So... Um, exactly because we believe that there won't be perfect substitutes because maybe of different features of CBDC, maybe programmability or something like that. That's why in our model there are also no substitutes. So that's why some sellers only accept CBDC and some only accept deposits. So that's actually, yeah, so the, 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 the point. Um, and the question on the model, so what, what happened, so if I understood uh, Mariana, your, your question correctly. So, what happens to the to, to the reserves after the in the second refinancing round? So, what happens is that um, so entrepreneurs get the CBDC and they will pay to the sellers to um, to get the additional reinvestment good. And sellers then can use the CBDC in the market too, so the centralized market to consume and to spend and to give it back to buyers. And buyers can use then use it to um to obtain deposits from the banks so it can so the buyers can revert it back to reserves and then get and reserves is basically cash on our model and then can turn that to deposits that's how that yeah the channel goes um so then your point on the um so whether omega 2 should depend on the cap actually i mean it's a good idea we could we could think about it i mean in general this omega 2 will depend on many features it will also depend on the cbdc rate so, I mean, it would be super interesting to adorganize it, but this will basically be another paper, I think, because it opens up so many more questions. Um, and then whether we have aggregate uncertainty. So, I mean, we don't. So this, um, 
these liquidity shocks are bank specific, so we don't have any aggregate uncertainty. And we are perfectly right that actually, yeah, in our model, it's like an autonomous, autonomous liquidity factor. Um, and of course, in reality, it's very likely that the central bank will react because now in our model, the amount of reserves is basically fixed. So if more reserves are needed, that will decrease and uh, that will immediately increase the interbank rate. But of course, in general, the central bank could and probably will react in increasing the supply of reserves. So, I mean, we heard similar comment before, we probably should work on that. Um, also, what is like the optimal amount of supply, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Maybe if I can add on the one-to-one -one conversion, I think the central bank always has means to ensure this one-to-one. -one. We are able to ensure one-to-one -one conversion between reserves and cash and its elastic supply at the same price. So I think that's something that uh, would also work in the case of CBDC. So this concludes the first paper and then we can move to the second one, uh, which will be presented by Galo. So, thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers for accepting this paper. If I'm not mistaken, this presentation is the only is the only thing that stands between the, all of you and uh, a very nice weekend, or maybe not that nice, that uh, will be idiosyncratic. So, I just hope that, uh, that you can stay with me for a, for a while, to, uh, because this paper in Hawaii in, in a certain way, it touches on, on several of the points that uh, have been discussed by, pre by previous papers, both today and yesterday. This is joint work with, with uh, of a couple of, of great guys from, from Banco España, and I mean, the usual disclaimers apply. So again, I, I will not get into, into why CBDC matters, and, uh, and in this paper, we are going to concentrate on the on the role of CBDC into the operational framework. For those of you who were yesterday in the in the keynote uh, speech by by Panetta, there was this question by a gentleman from Politico about a certain paper that makes these claims about the operational framework. That is the paper. So, I mean, just uh, just for that, I hope that uh, you will have because the the paper has been. Uh, relatively has received uh, a lot of attention by the by the press because uh, essentially we deal with something that is very topical today which is the operational framework as probably most of you know if not uh, i will tell you uh, a number of central banks uh, are currently or have been engaged over the last uh, over the last uh, 12 months in discussion about which is going to be their operational framework by operational framework essentially we mean which size and composition you want to have of assets and liabilities of the central bank and how do you want to steer your pol i mean how do you want to change your policy rates in order to steer the interbank typically the target rate in order to deliver on your price stability or 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 or, or, or whatever mandate that you have as a central banker so the point is that um, that cbdc may have a, a considerable impact on the on the on the sorry on the on the central bank so in order to essentially I mean the, 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 I, I, I will present here so 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 we are going to try to answer several questions I mean some are broader which is like if you read the popular especially I mean three four years ago if you but but still I mean in this year if you read the popular press you will always find an op-ed by someone in the Financial Times making the claim that um, that CBDC I mean the introduction of CBDC I mean and, and that and that, that you, you you hear more often than not from from representatives from commercial ba commercial banking unions that CBDC is gonna lead to a deposit crunch because there will be this uh, shift of deposits from the commercial banks to the to the central bank and hence that will lead to a credit crunch and that's going to make uh, credit more expensive and that's going to reduce credit and that's going to and that's going to slow down economic growth so then we should be very careful about uh, cbdc the first question that we want to make is that the uh, within the context of a general equilibrium standard new keynesian model so the, the the benchmark model that 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 people around use to analyze monetary policy transmission is that true or not 
the second question is, okay, fine, but how does it depends on the operational framework of monetary policy? I guess that many of you know that uh, since the crisis, not the last crisis, but the previous crisis, so since the great financial crisis, most central banks in the world have been operating what is typically called a floor system. So essentially it's a system characterized by huge central bank balance sheets, a lot of excess reserves, and then the interbank rates typically pegged to the, um, to the deposit facility rate in the case of the euro area or the interest on excess reserves in the case of the, of the Fed. So which are going to be the consequences or which would be the consequences of introducing a CBDC on the operational framework? And then, to, and then finally, we want to touch on the issues related to the, to the, to the Marcus and Dirk uh, paper about is, a, is there a way to make uh, the introduction of CBDC neutral, understood as not having any real impact on aggregate variables. So this is the kind of question that we are going to try to address. And in order to do that, what we are going to do is to introduce kind of a heterogeneous edge and tractable heterogeneous, heterogeneous bank uh, model into a standard new Keynesian structure. So, and then with an OTC search and matching the market in order to understand the interbank, the interbank. But, but to me, I mean, per particularly, I mean, I'm very biased because I'm, I'm one of the, one of the authors, but really I've, I've written many, many papers in my life and some are better and some are worse. What I really like of this uh, paper is the calibration. Uh, the calibration and the figures, I mean, the aesthetics of the figures, but this is because of my co-author. But leaving aside the aesthetic of the figures that you will see in a while, the calibration, I mean, is very nice. It's, it's, you, I mean, you will see. So, so which are the main results? Because I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that up to some point I will start losing track of the presentation and then I will run out of time. So then this is important that I can convey the main results uh, at the very at the very beginning. So first, there is the issue that uh, is true that uh, introducing, I mean, it was made by the previous paper, introducing CBDC will necessarily, I mean, one thing, one, one important caveat is that I'm an engineer, I'm not in the marketing business. I know nothing to marketing, I know nothing about customer experience, and then I have no idea whether CBDC is going to be a success or a failure. And neither do my co-authors. So then we don't make any, any uh, assessment about how successful CBDC is going to be or why it is going to be successful. Essentially, we are very agnostic and we consider a continuum of scenarios about CBDC take up. In, order, and some, in some of them, CBDC is extremely successful. In others, CBDC is maybe less successful or it's super successful but has been capped by this kind of holding limits by the central bank. So, so we don't take any stance on that. So then, in any case, Depending on how successful it is, what necessarily will happen is that the more successful it is, the larger the drain on cash and deposit that the, that the, the introduction of CBDC will produce. But then the, the, the issue is that, for the, in, let's say, in the first phase, given the huge volume of excess reserves that exist nowadays and that are forecasted to exist in the foreseeable, at least, close future, then, the, then this is just going to produce a reduction in the excess reserve, but we are going to keep on living in, a, in this kind of a floor system. However, there is a level, I typically call it the Reni, but people typically call it the kink, at which the volume of excess reserve is large enough, and hence the behavior, the dynamics in the interbank market ch uh, change, and the interbank, ma and the interbank rate will lift off from the deposit facility rate, and we will shift to a kind of a corridor system similar to the one that we were operating on, that we were operating in the euro area prior to, to 2007. But even in that case, the point is that um, even in, the, in a situation in which uh, reserves uh, start to be scarce, then the, 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 what will happen is a substitution from funding from deposits to funding from the central bank. But, but I mean, you may say, yeah, but funding from the central bank is going to be more expensive. But this is a partial equilibrium. This is a totally partial equilibrium approach because the, 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 the real interest rate of the, uh, of the central bank will be given by the whole stance of monetary policy. So then, depending on the whole stance, the funding should not be necessarily more expensive because the endogenous monetary policy reaction of the central bank and that's part of that. So that is an important issue. So the answer to the first question is, do the deposit crunch lead to a credit crunch? And the answer is no. Or 
Uh, yes, but to a very relatively small extent. And the reason of why it is happening is unrelated to the dynamics of the central bank. It's more related about the, 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 the kind of uh, Brunemeyer nipel dynamics, about the remuneration of the total wealth of the household. So it operates th through an entirely different channel. But then, of course, there are reasons, and, and, and there are reasons why you want to preserve the kind of, of, of floor system. And in that, I side with what uh, Panetta said yesterday. The central bank has tools to preserve a floor system either through outright purchases of bonds and credit operations. Notwithstanding, and that, notwithstanding, a deposit is not the same as a TLTRO because a, T, a, a deposit is a non collateralized. Uh, instrument for the banks, whereas TLTRO are collateralized. So that, that opens the door, and if I have time, I will talk a little bit more about that on the particular designs of this kind of credit operations into the, into the role of preserving the floor system. So this is more or less the, the roadmap of, 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 of what, what I want to, to, to say. Okay, great. Thank you. So the model can be summarized by this. I cannot walk, it's a pity. By this slide, essentially, what's the idea of the, of the model? What you have is that households, households can say, save in CBDC, in cash, and in deposits. The, and then the banks can be funded through deposits. By deposits, you can take both into account kind of retail deposits and wholesale deposits, even corporate deposits. I mean, for the purpose of the model, that is irrelevant. And actually, for the calibration, we are gonna, we are gonna lump them together. They can, banks can be funded through the lending facility of the, so the marginal lending facility, I mean the lending facility from the central bank or by equity. And essentially the business of banks is to, to, to just give loans to or purchase securities from the firms. And that is the way that firms, I mean, this kind of model, Lenny Miller structure from the side of the, of the firm holds in the model. So it's irrelevant whether firms are funded through loans or through equity, but this, all this funding comes from the, from the commercial banks. Commercial banks can also uh, invest into government bonds and they can also save into central bank reserves. Okay? And then the central banks on the liability side is going to have central bank reserves, cash and CBDC. And similar to the, to the, to the previous discussion, CBDC is just a direct, the same as cash, is just a direct claim on the CBDC. And CBDC, for most of my presentation, is going to be unremunerated, so 0% return on, to, on CBDC. And then the central bank on the asset side can have credit operations with the commercial banks on purchase bonds from the government. Okay? I'm not going to get into the whole of all the details, but in general, all the details as in the, as in the standard New Keynesian model, except those related to the heterogeneity of the banks and the interbank market. So this is where I want to talk. And, and I want just to make a point about uh, the demand for CBDC. How do we construct the demand for CBDC? One possibility is to go to this kind of uh, Kiyotaki right, Lagos, uh, microfound demand for money in order to understand which are the intrinsic values that CBDC will give to households. Another, which is this one, is to say, I have no idea why people are going to demand uh, CBDC, honestly. I'm not going to make any welfare assessment in this paper because I don't, I don't feel bold enough to, to say. So I'm going to consider, similar to other papers, this kind of liquidity in the utility function. For some reasons, people will, would like to hold CBDC. And this is going to be controlled by this parameter, eta DC. And essentially, what I'm going to do is a number of comparative statics about both steady states and transitions, so long-run situations and transitional dynamics for different scenarios of the take-up of CBDC controlled by that parameter. Okay. Then, how do the banks uh, how do the banks work? Essentially, we we built on a previous paper with with Oscar Arce here from the ECB and Dominic Taller also here from the ECB and Carlos and myself, which the idea is it's a relatively tractable model of bank heterogeneity. So essentially, what we assume is a continuum of islands. In each of the islands, there is a bank. This bank uh, interacts with uh, with firms. 
I'm not going to repeat the funding and the and, and the an investment of the banks, but it's pretty complex. But essentially, the the the, 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 the core idea is that we this is one of these morning afternoon models in which in the morning you you get some deposits but then in the afternoon maybe you realize that the productivity in your island is higher or lower and then you want to have more liquidity or less liquidity and then in order to get to get that liquidity or less liquidity you go to the interbank market a contrary to the to the previous uh, paper the people in the interbank market here are are more hard working and the interbank market is open so then you can go to the interbank market and, uh, and borrow or lend. So that's the role of the interbank market. Uh, that's the role of the interbank market here. And then banks are subject to this kind of leverage constraint that essentially limits the maximum, uh, the maximum size of the loans depending on your equity. Okay. So the important thing is to understand what is the role of the lending facilities of the of the central bank. The role of the lending facilities of the central bank is that they just give you an outside value in the bargaining that you have in the interbank market. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a commercial bank. I have, and I, I, you have seen this kind of interbank, uh, how the interbank market works. So essentially, I mean, I mean, not now, not anymore, but in the good old times, you just took the phone and said, look, I have this liquidity and I want to place it, which is the, I mean, <laughs> you get quotes and then you place it. So essentially, the point is that the quotes that you get depends on which is, the, what the people in the search and matching literature call is the tightness, is the, is the relationship between the volume of lending orders and the volume of borrowing orders. Because that gives you the idea of which is your, your market power, I mean, your, your bargaining power, in that uh, would be more precise. I mean, when you call and you know that if I hang the telephone, I can call another guy, and the other guy is going to give me a better quote, then if you don't give me a good quote, I call the other guy. However, if I've been extremely lucky that you took the, the phone for me, and I know that if you don't give me the price, now one else is going to give me, then I have to stick to your price. But then there is always an outside option. And which is the outside option? The outside option is that if no one else wants to hold the telephone for me, I can always go to a central bank and deposit at the, at the deposit facility or borrow at the borrower. So the way that monetary policy steers in any kind of corridor is by giving these outside options into the bargaining protocol between the, between the borrowing and the lending banks. Okay. So in a way, with this kind of a stupid example, I have explained more or less the way of this kind of OTC search and matching markets, a Alfonso Lagos or Bianchi Abillo, that are underlying to our, uh, to our structure. Okay. So the bottom, the bottom line of that, that it works? Yes. So the bottom line is at the end, the interbank rate is going to be a linear combination between the two facilities of the, of the, um, of the central bank, but the position within the corridor is going to depend on the tightness, it's going to depend on the volume of excess reserves, if you want, uh, like that. It's going to be linked to that, okay? Then there is a, a way of pass-through from the interbank rate to deposit, but I will skip it. Then the central bank just operates uh, a, a fixed corridor, and, uh, and then we have this, uh, and follows this kind of tailor rule for monetary policy. And then the balance sheet of the central bank is the one that I described. So essentially, it's the bond holdings. In the marginal lending facility, what do you have? You have the total volume of, um, of borrowing orders that didn't find a match. So then the, it's important to discuss which are the different kind of operational framework that you may face. A floor system, a corridor system, or God forbid that, even a sailing system. The idea, of this, uh, the idea of this regime is that in a floor system, what you have is ab abundant liquidity condition, so the tightness goes to zero. So essentially all borrowing banks are matched with lending ones, and then most lending the bank deposits at, at, at the central bank. So essentially, the, the deposit facility rate is a key policy rate because it controls the interbank rate. I've, I've wasted, I mean, many hours, thank you, with journalists trying to explain them that the MRO now is a totally inconsequential for the transmission of monetary policy in the euro area, but they still in Spain, they keep on reporting that the MRO is whatever and said, okay, fine. So the corridor system is what it used to be. And in that case, the, I mean, the, 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 the corridor is key and the two facilities play a role because you are in the, in the, in the middle of the, of the system. So this is just, I gave you a brief overview of the operational framework. And now the quantitative exercise. The, as I said, the calibration is great. And this is what I like the most. How do we do the calibration? We don't, the cali we don't calibrate that for the today because CBDC is not going to be launched tomorrow. So essentially, we need to understand how, which is going to be the operational framework in the medium run, let's say 10 years ahead. 
But I don't know the future. If I knew the future, I wouldn't work in a central bank. I would work in a hedge fund. But as I don't know the future, I work in a central bank. And then the only thing that I can use is this amazing survey called the Survey of Monetary Analysts that is run by the, by the ECB before any governing council and that make all kind of crazy questions to the, to the financial analysts. And among these is how large, which facilities, which interest rates, whatever, expect to have in the euro area in the next month, in the next quarter, and in the long run. So essentially, this is how we calibrate the model. We calibrate the model for the long run. That part one. And then the second part, I mean, then we, 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 we draw from the literature about this elasticity of substitution, but then a key issue is that. This is data and model. The black line is the model. And I mean, don't tell me that this, this figure is not super beautiful. I mean, <laughs> It, it, it's, it's, I mean, I really like it. So, so the dark blue is very far in the past. It's uh, like 1999. Some of you were not even born in 1999. The the red hot part is the uh, is the current. I mean, is the is the is is is, is the present. So essentially, uh, this is the link. I mean, this is the data between the interbank rate, that in our case is not the stair, because with the stair there is a problem of the leaky floor, because non-banks can intervene. So this is a repo, so it's a, it's a collateral, right? but I mean, don't care about that. Trust my word. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. So this is the interbank rate minus the, minus the deposit facility rate. And then you see that relationship. This is, this is an equilibrium relationship. This is not a demand curve. This is the whole, so this is the demand curve cut by the supply curve in different moments in time, okay? And this is the equilibrium relationship produced by the model, because we calibrate the model to replicate the data. Of course, and this is something that concerns very much our dear colleagues from the, from the Fed, it can be that this historical relationship has changed with time, because the Basel III regulations or higher liquidity demand by banks have pushed that to the right. If that is the case, you should see the results of this paper as a as a kind of uh, of an upper bound. So everything will happen before we expect that in the in the paper, okay? So then we calibrate, and this is what I really like, we really calibrate the whole aggregate balance sheet of the financial sector and of the central bank in the euro area. I mean, this is not that we put a couple of numbers. I mean, this is a very serious calibration exercise in order to replicate the balance sheets of banks and of the central bank. I wish I could spend more time. I will focus on this slide because uh, I think I will run out, run out of time in a couple of minutes. But uh, but this uh, this slide uh, kind of conveys some of the at least the first part of messages that I was uh, highlighting. This, as I said, is just a combination. I really regret that I cannot move there. But anyway, it is uh, so. In the x-axis, what you see is the amount of CBDCs in circulation in the steady state in the long run. I have no idea how much it's going to be. If we impose a 3,000 euros uh, holding limit, it will be equivalent to around a 6% of the, of the GDP. Okay, so maybe it will stay everyone, every European citizen will, will want that and it will be 6%. Maybe it will be a huge success, it will be 40%, or maybe it will be a failure and it will be 0%, okay? And then what you see is, depending on that, so this, don't see that as an as a evolution in time. This is an evolution of time. This is, an, uh, this is a continuum of alternative scenarios. You see it like that. So what you see is that the larger the, larger the take up of CBDC, the larger the reduction in both and cash and deposits. Both of them are going to be, of course, if CBDC would be remunerated, I mean, it would impact even more. But this is a non-remunerated non CBDC. Then, as you go increasing, the amount of, 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 of CBDC, uh, you go reducing the amount of excess reserves. I mean, this is almost autological. But then there is a point in which you jump from a floor and to a, into a corridor. I mean, even if people cannot see me, by, um, cannot hear me, but I will show it here. Those, those are the points in which essentially what is happening, this is a very strange figure to see because what you see as almost constant is the interbank rate. So what, what you see in this figure that seems to be moving is not the interbank rate, is the deposit facility rate. Because in a way, as I was saying, the interbank rate in a steady state is, is, is I mean, it's given 
And this is a model in which the natural rate is endogenous, but, 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 but in a way it is endogenous to the monetary policy decisions in order to preserve price stability. So what you see that is decoupling for the interbank rate is a deposit facility rate. It's kind of a, of a twisted logic of, 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 of a steady state. But this is where you move from the, from the floor to the, to the corridor. But the bottom line, I mean, the most important issue is given by panel F. So the, in panel F, you see that even if it's, there is a certain decrease in the, in the volume of bank credit, bank equity, and output. Quantitatively, it is tiny. It is very small. This is a quantitative exercise. And this is very small because essentially what is happening is this substitution by, from deposit lending to central bank lending. And the reason why it is falling it's just because the remuneration of wealth of the of the um, of the deposit. So this is why it relates to to to, to Dirk's and, and, and Marcus' work, which is that it, if you remunerate CBDC, it is possible to find a way of remunerating CBDC such that, from the point of view of the household, the remuneration of wealth is uh, is neutral. And then, the, if you operate in a floor or in a ceiling, then essentially. Uh, you find no no effect during a corridor. You will always have some some losses uh, of, of of output and, and of efficiency, but those are related mainly to the fact of seniorias. The fact is that during a corridor, I mean during a floor system, the or or or, or, or a sailing system in a steady state, this amount of of of, of I mean, with this remuneration, the, the, the seniorias doesn't change for the central bank. But within a floor, there are always. I mean, the, 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 the orders that go to the marginal lending facility and the orders that go to the to the deposit facility rate, as you make an extra cut. I mean, that, that would be, you tell me, I'm not getting what you say, don't worry. I mean, this is like, uh, I don't know if you have seen the American Beauty, that at the end of the movie, there is this issue that you said, uh, probably you don't know what I'm talking about, but don't worry, one day you will know. So this is the same. So if you want to know, read the paper. So, so let me conclude. I mean, we could talk about the transitional dynamics, but the figure is less beautiful. But I, I will just make a point about the transitional dynamics, which is totally kind of counterfactual. I mean, it's very intuitive, which is if you introduce CBDC, which is something that is going to uh, compete mainly 0% remunerated CBDC, that is something that is competing again cast mainly, what you will observe according to this model in the first decade, is a huge increase in the demand for cash. How is that possible? Due to the magic of the new Keynesian model, which is as the introduction of CBDC is going to be recessionary, even if uh, uh, even very likely recessionary in the long run, it is going to be deflationary in the short run. And given that it is deflationary, that means that uh, that uh, it pushes prices down. But then. Monetary policy will react and it will also reduce nominal rates and real rates down. So then from the point of view of the household, you will find that you get you want to get more CBDC, but then deposits, the remuneration of deposits, the real remuneration of deposit is going down due to the action of the central bank, whereas the real remuneration of cash is going up because inflation is going down and then the real return on cash is going up and then you want to hold more cash. Is that something realistic or not? I have no idea, but this is what the theory would predict. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Nuno. And now the discussion will be done by Leah. Yep. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to discuss this uh, very great paper. And um, actually, I have to admit, I was already quite a big fan of the underlying framework. So introducing CBDC into this framework, now I find this paper even more interesting. Um, so um, maybe shortly in a nutshell, I think um, it is a very elegant yet um, compre comprehensive uh, new Keynesian model that includes a realistic central bank balance sheet and interbank market dynamics via search and matching frictions. And that allows us uh, to combine the analysis 
on the implementation of monetary policy and analysis of its macro effects and kind of in one uh, framework which makes it very flexible and um, kind of able to speak to a lot of ongoing debates in the literature um, while also contributing to a uh, debate that so far has been neglected a, li a little bit by the literature but as we see you saw also by the other um, papers in, in the sessions or in, in the conference is now coming up more and more as well. So maybe very shortly, uh, let us uh, recap on the results. So we have uh, non-remunerated CBDC as a baseline. We have a floor system um, in the future and um, in the baseline, CBDC um, induced deposit crunch will not uh, imply a credit crunch. Uh, however, if not managed, CBDC may affect the operational framework. But um, I think it's already uh, quoted to kind of to Bonetta. I mean, we can we can do undo what we have done. So a uh, pre CBDC floor system can easily be maintained by um, increasing the reserves, either via lending operation or bond purchases. Um, we have a kind of we have a um, contractionary effect that's small, but it's kind of the I think also here just the, the tendency or the trend uh, matches that um, may be um, kind of um, recovered by remunerating CBDC. And then we'll end, um, or we can recover the result of uh, Bruno Mayer and Niepel to kind of have the equivalence of private and public money. I also tried to spice up a bit <laughs> the presentation with, a, uh, with some pictures, given that it's the last uh, one before lunch. So um, the story is really quickly, this is actually what Dali gives me when I, um, I describe to him a New Keynesian household, a typical New Keynesian household. So he loves consumption, he hates work and he loves money. We have money in the utility via CES aggregator. And what's central here is, is that money is either banknotes that are non-renumerated, CBC that's also non-renumerated, and deposits. And I think this will really matter the remuneration of the different types of money, because that will actually create this wealth effect. Then we have this um, kind of island bank firm story that was uh, explained really well uh, by um, like also, so um, we have kind of different types of banks, oh, different types of banks, firms, combination on, on different islands that have this idiosyncratic um, um, productivity shock and are either less or, uh, less or more productive in each period. So this will determine their different types of borrowing and lending orders and the, um, the balance of these borrowing and lenders, lending orders determines uh, kind of then where the interbank market rate is. So if it's balanced, we're kind of in the middle of the corridor. If there are more lending or uh, lending orders, uh, then the interbank market rate is pushed through the floor system and also kind of the, the demand from the deposit facility, the deposit facility becomes more, much more important. And of course, the other way around, if you have like a lot of borrowing orders, then the lending facility becomes more important and uh, the interbank market rate is pushed to the ceiling. So that's kind of the quick recap of the story. I have um, two main comments and uh, maybe let me also note that uh, already two, uh, two weeks ago, this um, paper was discussed by um, Cyril Money in the Money Markets com uh, Conference of the ECB. So I will be complimentary to his, uh, his comments and I'll really kind of focus on the, on the macro effects. So let us, look of the, let us look at the result that we have a non-remunerated CBDC that reduces output. I mean, it's not big, but I think the, kind of the main channel is important here. How does this happen? So we have uh, remunerated deposits and then household shifts from remunerated deposits to unremunerated CBDC. So overall, the average return on liquidity will be reduced. This increases kind of overall the opportunity cost of holding money and makes it less attractive. So of course, um, I will hold less or I hold less, uh, generally less liquidity. This leads to a decline in lending to firms and also to a decline in production. But I was, what, what, what I was asking myself is, where did the money go? So let's have a look at where did the money go? So we have this, this lower remuneration and now um, households get kind of lower returns on their savings. However, this, um, lower kind of the lower lower return on savings profits kind of the counterparty who has to pay less interest and actually this counterparty here is the central bank so uh, kind of this leads to kind of higher central bank profits that are redistributed 
to the government. So we have higher transfers to the government and the government balance sheet is very simple. We have constant bond holdings, so an increase in the profit of CBD, uh, in kind of the profit from the central bank will lead to a decrease in taxes. So overall, we end up back ah uh, here. We end up back um, at kind of um, at the taxes level. So it's basically kind of just a redistribution within the within the household balance sheet. So why does it matter? And I think, or I think it matters because we shift funds from the friction, very friction loaded or the kind of the, the friction loaded banking sector into kind of a completely frictionless sector. So we have a, because the government, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, we have constant debt to GDP. It's quite passive. It's constant debt to GDP at his non-distortionary taxes and no government spending. So um, what I was asking myself is how much is of this wealth effect is coming from kind of having frictions in the banking sector, but no frictions uh, in the fiscal sector. And I think actually the paper of this important channel, this expansionary fiscal channel, um, is an important uh, channel also in the paper by Bader and Kumhoff, and is also present in the paper by Boulogne et al. I think a second related uh, point to this is um, that we have uh, kind of all the assets that households hold, the monetary assets. So we have kind of liquidity, uh, kind of we have, and, and that are motivated through this money in the, um, in the money in the utility function. But in reality, so everything that we kind of we have money, kind of we have all the assets to use as money as a medium of exchange, but also to store value. And I think here the store value is a concept of also what's really creating this wealth effect. So my question is kind of what would the presence of an additional non-monetary asset um, kind of um, how would this affect it um, and would it maybe just simply shift from liquid assets to illiquid asset? And I think if I have time, I want to uh, very shortly focus on my second point is so on CBDC balance sheet adjustments. So um, we have four ways in which CBDC issues can kind of affect the central bank balance sheet. Either we have uh, kind of the, the demand for coming from banknotes and then it's really neutral. We just have a kind of a very, uh, very um, simple or kind of easy liquidity swap. Just the households are holding a different type of central bank liability. If it's coming from deposits, we have kind of either a decrease in reserves um, and this will also just be a liability swap. It will not affect the size of the central bank balance sheet. If for some reason, kind of we want to keep the level of reserves to a certain level um, or we want to keep it constant we can also offset cdc issues either by an increase in bonds or an increase in lending and this would then imply kind of a, um, an increase of the central bank balance sheet and um, i think this is kind of very important and all four possibilities are also in this framework and in this paper and um, I was actually wondering about the macro effects of the different policies that are in place, um, maintained to keep the floor system. I think this could be explained a bit more um, because I'm wondering the policies affect the economy via different channels. So do they have a different macro effect? So I think that would be interesting also to hear a bit more about this. Um, and I think it's also very important because really the literature needs a more systematic analysis of those general equilibrium effects of um, of CBD central bank balance sheet adjustments. And I think the framework has all the ingredients. So kind of it's less of a comment, but more of a suggestion to do further research um, with this paper. And I think it would be doing kind of analyzing this question. Maybe it would be also interesting to um, include a few other elements, for example, kind of also, I mean, a more fiscal, maybe a more sophisticated fiscal sector, maybe also introducing this kind of government bonds as collateral requirements and maybe additional um, regulation. But I think then it would be a very, um, very important contribution also to the literature, because I think this is also where still some work needs to be done. Um, and with that, yeah, I think it's a very, um, very elegant, very flexible and a rich framework. And uh, that I think, uh, yeah, it can, can be used to do um, much more additional research with. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion, and we have time for a few questions. So there is uh, Oscar, Dirk, Matteo. Yes, thanks for these uh, very good last presentations of the conference. 
Um, uh, Carlo, I would like to like your simulation as much as you do. And I think for that, um, I would like to be convinced why it's okay to not have any liquidity regulation in the quantitative exercise. Because I think, I mean, I've done some simulations of Euro area data uh, using bank level data, and we find that actually it's the LCR requirement that's uh, the first that becomes binding for a majority of banks when they consider uh, how to adjust to CBDC. So that seems also relevant in your framework. I have an online question and then I would uh, hand over to Dirk. So the question online is from Paolo Ferratelli and he says, uh, your model assumes that for bank deposit funding and central bank funding, these are um, virtually equivalent apart from the different rates. However, in the real world, we would also need to consider the opportunity cost of holding appropriate collateral to access central bank liquidity and the different regulatory treatment or deposits compared to central bank borrows, uh, borrowing, for example, the LCR and the NFSR ratios. And could you envisage a manner to include these implicit costs, which might be substantial in your model, when banks run out of reserves and need to switch from deposit funding to central bank funding? I think this matches a little bit with uh, what Oscar had as a question. Thank you. I, I, I have a bit of a disagreement about the intuition of the non-neutrality, and I think I'm closer to what Leah said here. So we know from what we discussed also in the morning that with, with the CES liquidity aggregate, you will never be able to get neutrality. And we understand why, because you have a non-linear rate of substitution between those two things. So if you change the composition of liquidity, the spreads will change and everything will change. That's for sure. So that is the fundamental source of non of, of non neutrality. You emphasize the, the the return on the household savings. I don't think that is any source of, of non equivalence here because as Leah emphasized, I mean, you have essentially recurring equivalence or whatever, right? The, the household absorbs all the wealth effects and uh, there's not per se any friction in, in the household savings. They choose to adjust their portfolio because the spreads on these different assets change because of the CES liquidity aggregation. That is the, the only source of non-neutrality. The other source that you have in your simulations, but I think you don't need to have them, is this frictional interbank market. But if I understood correctly, that is not truly frictional in the sense that there are some resources lost in the process of matching the two sides of the market. It's just a mapping from the interest rate that the central bank sets into the interest rate that the banks face because those weights change with the tightness of the interbank market. But if the central bank were to adjust its rate appropriately, the central bank could always make sure that the rates that the banks face are ex fully insulated relative to the situation before the introduction of CBDC. So you could perfectly insulate the banks from everything CBDC related if you wanted to, and then it's only the, the CES aggregator that has any real implications. But of course, you fix that rate that the central bank sets, if I understood correctly. And therefore, you get this additional boost, but that's by assumption. And therefore, I think all your real, also your real effects on output, etc., are probably mostly reflecting this ad hoc assumption about what the central bank does. And to some extent, for sure, also CES, but I understood when I saw your paper last time that the CES part quantitatively doesn't matter much, but conceptually it is the only friction I think that matters. Hi. So uh, one of the main results of your paper is that uh, like the introduction of CBDC um, uh, causes uh, a mild recession and your argument is that, uh, you know, the interest rate set uh, by the central bank in general equilibrium will be uh, reduced. But then, like, I mean, we started talking about CBDC in a period of zero lower bound. And from what I understand in your model, there is no zero lower bound. So how would, uh, like, the presence of this CBDC, uh, like, how would it change the result if you had a zero lower bound in your model? considering that you wouldn't have this like general equilibrium adjustment of the interest rate. So then I would give you the opportunity to respond. So first of all, I mean, I, 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 I want to, I want to, to, to be very thankful for the, for the discussion because 
as, as, as Lea was saying, so the paper was presented a, a, a couple of weeks ago, and then it's not always easy to, to find a, to make a discussion of when you have already seen a discussion of a paper. But I think, uh, I mean, something that I like of, 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 of a discussion is when you learn something about your own paper, and, it, and that was the case, and that connects with, with Dirk's uh, comment. So let me go in order, I mean, in, the, in the particular order with, with all the points. The, the point of the fiscal reaction is a, it's a, it's a very good one that I have never thought about. So, so that is something that we need to, that we need to think about uh, whether results would change or not uh, with different uh, fiscal reactions and, 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 and revisit uh, the Bardera and Kunhoff and the, and the Burlon et al. paper in that, uh, in that particular dimension. So that, that is a point well taken. Then the, then about the, um, the presence of, of, of non-monetary uh, non -monetary assets and the more general the issue of collateral requirements, uh, I, 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 I don't know how to answer. I mean, in the sense that I would need to think more about that, about what would be the implications or how can it be introduced. I mean, it's not a, it's not a simple question to answer and I don't want to give a rush answer. Then the, um, the, the Oscar San Paolo's questions about the, the liquidity regulations and the collateral requirements, are, 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 are totally true. I mean, those are important things, but the way, as I was saying, the, the way that I see them essentially is that uh, if those, um, I mean, they will uh, shift the demand for the demand for for reserves to the right, essentially. So there are several papers. There is a paper by Annette Vicin Jorgensen and, and David Lopez Salido, and there is an, another one by by a bunch of guys from the um, from the New York Fed, including John Williams, Domenico Giannoni, I think it's uh, Gar Alfonso, but I'm I'm leaving some co-authors, which they just discuss this kind of things, both theoretically and empirical, which are the, the determinants of the demand for reserves, and then I mean. The, the, this uh, I, I, I totally agree, but then in in that case that would mean a shift of the demand for reserves to the to the right, and that would make us that that all the all the quantitative all the quantification would be as I said an upper bound because essentially all this mechanism would kick out uh, earlier. That says uh, for a smaller amount of take up, you would already have that. So so that is uh, so that is uh, true. Then let me jump one second. Um, one second, uh, uh, Dirk's question, and 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 move to the last question about the about the the issue of the zero hour bound. In the first version, when we started the paper, we started analyzing the case of a zero. I mean, moving from a zero hour bound uh, and whether you would be converging to a zero hour bound. So, so they were quite present in our mind. But given that uh, in the current um, economic environment, the the what the markets at least expect of the likelihood of a zero hour bound is much diminished, we have shifted to this kind of normal situation. But but I mean, the presence of the zero hour bound uh, would matter to a, to a certain extent. But the issue is that in, this is not a paper about how, I mean, the, such as Andy Levins or Michael Bordo statements that uh, CBDC allows to to defeat the zero hour bound or, or, or can roll off because you can charge negative rates because I mean having cash you will never you will never have it. But we have also we never published that paper, but we have used this framework to analyze these kind of issues about how banks suffer with the zero hour bound. But but it's true that we didn't we decided not to explore that in that paper because I mean we saw that less policy relevant. And then coming to to Dirk points uh, I need to think about that because um because uh, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely sure about the about the. I mean, I, I knew Jorge was telling me about that, and we were discussing it uh, like last week, uh, no, this week. I mean, like uh, three days ago, for for one hour about that point. But but I would need to, to because because I'm not entirely. I'm not entirely convinced about the issue of why. Because the point is that um, essentially you can. not for a floor system, you can prove that if you remunerate, uh, that if you remunerate um, as you would do in the in the counterfactual scenario with all that, all the equations are the same. So then I don't see why this issue that that uh, CES doesn't allow you to to I mean that always breaks um, that. Uh, 
I'm, 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 I'm not entirely sure, but, but, but the, the fact that I'm not entirely sure doesn't mean anything. I mean, it can be right, it can be wrong. So, so but, but if you don't mind, I would like to ask you a little bit uh, about that uh, later. So thank you very much. I mean, thank you, thank you very much for all the, for, for the discussion and for all the questions. Thank you very much as well. So before we end, I have still a few words to say. So first, I would like to make you aware of a special issue of the Journal of Economics, which um, Michael uh, Frankel and I will act as guest editors. So submissions are still open. So it will be a, a special volume on CBDC. And if anybody of you has a paper or knows somebody who has a paper, you are invited to, to submit. Uh, submissions are open until 8 of January. And we uh, it will be peer reviewed. and. Um, we uh, aim for a quick turnover with a publication, online publication, uh, by the middle of the year. The other thing is such a conference uh, cannot happen without uh, <laughs> a lot of help from many people. So first, I would like to uh, thank the presenters, the discussants, but also you as the audience who came here to Frankfurt. And I think it makes always a very nice and lively discussion The people are on site. So thanks very much for that. Then I would like to thank our um, media team. So Stefan Seitz, Anja Zinsch and Isabel Schmidtknecht from uh, uh, DG Communications, as well as the TVN team for um, a perfect technical support. So um, one tends to underestimate the, the work and the efforts that are needed that everything is broadcasted in a nice way. So uh, the, the recordings will be on the ECB's website. So if you want to get back to, to a discussion or to the questions, you will be able to see that in a few days. And this is really very much appreciated. Then, of course, I have to thank Elise Chrétien and Nina Willenberg, who did the administration. So Elise, mostly on marketing and also paper submission. I think everybody of you has got an email from, from Nina at some point in time. So this is on top of her usual work. And this is really something that uh, is, is, is uh, very much appreciated. And then, of course, Dirk, who had the idea uh, for this conference and to um, address the ECB to, to set this off and also was instrumental in bringing people together. And then, of course, my ECB colleagues, Tony Arnard, uh, Massimo uh, Ferrari, Arnaud May, and uh, also Peter Hoffmann, who, uh, yeah, we as a team across business areas, which is always kind of an effort in the ECB, <laughs> we, we, uh, I think we had a great collaboration and it was really very enjoyable and uh, we are all happy that this conference was, uh, yeah, quite successful. So before we part, I would like to wish you a good trip back. Uh, we will have a buffet lunch outside, so please go there, enjoy some lunch, and uh, I hope to see all of you again at some point, hopefully quite soon. Thank you very much.